first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming. This is an incredible opportunity to have you guys all in one room, and I'm honored that you are here and spending time with us. So thank you for yeah. being here. I want to rewind the clock a little bit. You are here for a reason, and that you, you have all made fantastic movies this year. And I'm curious, this is an open question to anybody. When you're making a movie, or when you're making this particular movie or any movie, do you know while you're making it that it actually is going to turn out to be good? Or do you know that it, is it more the absence that it's not going to be bad? In other words, while you're in the process of making a film, is there any indication that you have as an actor that things are going to turn out well? And if so, what are those things while you're filming? Uh, well, I, I always feel it's going to turn out well. Good. <laughs> uh, it sometimes does, but uh, in, in the case of, of this film, I felt very comfortable with it. I didn't know if, if, if well means that, that you won't be embarrassed by the product, that's one, that's one set of mind. Very often you have to face the other obligation, uh, which is, will it turn out well for the people who put the money into making this? Mm -hmm. And that one is a little bit more hard to judge. Mm -hmm. I think to judge whether the, uh, it will be received by an audience. You don't know if the story that you're trying to give, like the gift that you're trying to do, is going to touch people or not. But I think there's a time sometimes when you're working that you can feel a, a transience or a feeling, you know, and you know that something special is going on. And it's that gift that you get to take with yourself, and you're hoping that that gift will translate to the audience itself, to the people, you know. And we're actors, of course, so something might go very well on set, and then you think, wait a minute. What's standing in between me and this going well? The editor! <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we don't know, do we? I mean, we sh we're, we're, the, we're the raw materials, but I mean, it's all in that director, he or she, and the, the editor together putting it. That's, that's where we live or die, in a way, isn't it? Yeah, the it? context. If what you're doing in the greater context of the whole film necessarily is going to, I guess, um, <clears throat> translate the way that, that it, it feels on set. I, 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 I usually can tell when it's going to be bad, but I can't really tell when it's going to be good. <laughs> so is it the absence of, 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 of it being bad that suggests that it's going to be good, if those things aren't present? Yeah, I guess the, 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 the idea of what it's going to be like when it comes out, at least for me so far, it just creates too much pressure yeah. in my mm -hmm. brain, so I can't even really go there. Uh, I mean, particularly with this last thing, I couldn't even, to the point where when we first showed it, I, I was like, I didn't really think that we were going to show it, even though I knew it was a Coen Brothers. <laughs> but that, that felt, that it was a real feeling. Because uh, I think when it goes really good is when it feels very intimate and small, and that actually goes away, the thought of what it's going to be like, ultimately. Right. You're, you're hopeful in the moment, you know, but then you kind of have to forget about that, yeah. in a way. And, uh, and that's a mark of, its, of a scene or a moment's success sometimes, is just the fact that it's actually in a kind of haze, mm -hmm. you know, that you're not mm -hmm. thinking about the other thing. You're just working, and you're in the moment with the other actors. I think that's important that you, most of the time, you don't think about the movie at all. You just think about the little, the little meal you have in front of you, and, and uh, you know, how to manage that part. About those moments, about those yeah, small Yeah, and that's also because that's where the fun of it is mm -hmm. for an actor. It's the problem-solving aspect of it, trying to you know, get the most out of that little nugget of story that you have in your hands for that short period of time. When you're thinking about doing a movie, is it easier to say yes or easier to say no? Depends on the script. Mm. Entirely. Well, for me, anyway. Mm -hmm. Or, unless you really need to earn money. <laughs> Meaning, well, this is it's also easier to say yes that, in that sometimes, instance. Sometimes, you know, I've run out of money from time to time and said I've got to do something. So. You know, you might do something, you might make your choices differently. There are economic things at play, even though we're all very lucky. We've not always been very lucky, and we may not always remain lucky in terms of our profession. So, mm. But then it's the script for me. Mm. Is it good? And if it is, I'm happy to, you know, make the tea, mm. actually. If the script is great, and, and the director, you feel a vision from the director or something, point of view, you know, then and it starts to all add up. Then the rest of it comes into play with the other artists and stuff. But you got a great script, a director with vision, and then this grouping of great, great artists around us. If you're lucky enough to get a great script and you start reading it, do you hear yourself as that character? Do you see yourself as that character? Do you feel yourself as that character? What are the elements 
of starting to feel comfortable about that part and which one comes first. I'm sure it's different for all of you. How would you describe the process? Choosing something is about will it maintain my interest for the amount of time it takes to shoot it? You know, will, will it continue to engage my imagination and, you know, uh, for the entire length of, of how long it takes? And so a lot of different factors, uh, you know, can, can, can cause me to think, okay, yeah, I can, I can definitely see myself. You know, maybe if, if, it's, if it's a little skeletal still, but this director has such an amazing vision that I think that will be able to engage my curiosity enough so that I don't ever get lazy. Yeah, it's always a question of sort of seeing yourself inside it, for me, mm -hmm. you know. Can I see myself inside this, inside this moment? Do I recognize myself somehow in, in this story? Because you you know, you're playing somebody <laughs> else, but you're also playing a reflection of yourself in some ways, which is what I think, for me, is so interesting about being an actor is that you are doing, it's, it's an art form that has that sort of double meaning. You're always talking about your own ideas in a way um, through these other characters. So it's a question of whether you can connect to that or not. And I know in the case of 12 Years a Slave, that was a very complicated question for you, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was. And I couldn't, um, you know, I, it took me a, a while to find it, to, to see myself inside it, to see myself inside this story. And, and, I, um, and it really took going back to the book and really understanding that it's that the sort of wider, the wider implications of the story were things that could fall away in my mind as long as I really understood and tried to connect to Solomon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, was, that was the journey and the sort of delay in me accepting the part. Lupita's a little bit different from, with you, and this is your first film, that you're looking at it as both an opportunity to become an actor and I suspect a conversation is simultaneous about the character that you've, you're trying to portray. Yeah, but um, you know, I've done a lot of theater and uh, one of the games I like to play when I receive a script is to, f first of all, not know which character I'm going in for. Mm -hmm. you know? Just read it to just get a sense of the whole story and then after that, ask myself, who would I play in this, in this, in this um, movie, this play, and then go and find out which, who I'm going in for. Um, because I think it gives, me, it gives you like an objective view of the whole thing, and um, you, you, you avoid talking yourself out of being able to play a certain character, you know? Sometimes you, mm -hmm. the saboteur in you wants to <laughs> talk you out of it. And so that's how I get myself involved in the story first and then the next read is an investigation of the character that I'm going in for. And how much of it is, I mean in, the, in your case, how much of it is technical? It's like I understand this character, how am I actually going to pull this off? How am I going to play these songs? I mean are you thinking those same, same things simultaneously or is it as Lupita describes that it's kind of a binary decision? You do yes no to this thing and then you kind of move down the, the process. Like how much do you factor in all the technical aspects exactly. that would While you're that the require? In terms of can I pull this off technically? Do I have the skills to do these songs and do this performance? I assume I do. <laughs> I think you do. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> but yeah, but then I think you're absolutely right. There is that little voice that starts sabotaging that, you know, that initial instinct of, of yeah, I'm open and ready and what do, what do you got? And then you start to that eye starts to look at it and, and, and calculate a little too much sometimes. And so it is a constant struggle between instinct and calculation. You so, know? so who do you look for as a sounding board as you're considering doing something and maybe, <laughs> maybe it's not in, in the case of these movies, that you're weighing, it's a 50-50 decision, yes, no. Who are your sounding boards? How do you make a decision about what you should and should not do? Who do you get counsel from? I always ring Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> and what does he tell you? He, tell, he just says, who is this? <laughs> no. I, I really don't depend on anybody, and I don't think that I can. I think you really have, um, you have to make your own choices. It may take a bit of thinking. You may want to, you want to, may want to go on the, beyond that first step of reading the screenplay and investigate uh, you know, meet with the director, the other people involved. Maybe I'll have questions about the, the script. But I, I can't really um, depend on anybody else. I think it's, it's your own decision. It has to be an emotional decision. And uh, it's a tough decision sometimes. 
Is it the same for you, Chua Chow? Yeah, it's you get, I suppose you get whatever counsel you can. I mean, people who've read the script and, and uh, as Harrison says, you know, meeting the directors, speaking to agents, you know, other people who are involved in the process. But it is, um, in the end, you know, a choice that only you can make, you know. And, uh, um, and I think that, you know, decisions is such an important part of being an actor, and that's why it becomes quite complicated sometimes, you know, because you are weighing up sometimes a number of different factors. Uh, and it's a leap of faith in so many ways, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, so there's so much of it that's based on trust. And how much, Emma, if, if Harrison's not taking your phone calls, mm. how, how much of, it, of your thinking is strategic, meaning I've just done this romantic comedy, I need to do a thriller, or I don't want to be typecast as this kind of person, I need no, to do this, or is it, that like the it. worst mistake you can make? <laughs> none of it, just strategic, that was just made every muscle word? in my body <laughs> twitch. No, it's horrible. Um, I've never understood the word career either. I, I, as far as I know, and I bet you all feel the same way as me, you just, things come along and you think, oh, am I going to get on to that? You know, you don't know, do you? It's not a career, it's a series of decisions, mm -hmm. like you say. And one, you might do a job and think, you know, well, maybe I won't play the cocaine dealer who can also fandango so well again <laughs> this year. That would be a bit repetitive, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, although I did in fact play a long series of what my mother described as good women in frocks. Um, <laughs> and so it was quite nice to get out of that from time to time, but that's, from, that's a personal point exactly, of view. That's, that's not mean. thinking, you know, ooh, they must be so bored. Or exactly, that there's something work. that you might want to do that you haven't had a chance to do. Um, there's always something like that, mm -hmm. always, you know. I want to hear from this side. I mean, we've covered a couple of questions, but in terms of how you decide, um, counsel, the emotional versus the rational way of making a decision, is it the same for you as well? Yeah, yeah, it has to be emotional. I mean, it's, um, I, I mean, every time you show, I show up, you know, for the first day, it's always a humiliating experience. So it's, <laughs> so I have to know what, what I'm going to go shame myself for. <laughs> Because I just, it is a weird thing. I mean, you know, the number one fear is public speaking, right? I mean, there, there's something that's naturally really, hmm. like, terrifying about it. And I think that you're right. It is, for me, the same thing. It's never like playing someone else. You're just playing a version of yourself under different, cir completely different circumstances, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, I think that's why the decision is so difficult. Because it, it does, it's, um, it's, a, it's a painful process and also joyful. Boris, what about you? I'm always like trying to figure out how to, to expand myself as a human being, mm -hmm. to grow. And so, like he says, it's looking for a part of myself, but I'm looking for that part of myself that may be a small molecule sometimes, mm -hmm. and that frightens me. And I'm trying to expand it. And so I, I, I make my choices based on sometimes, not, not about doing something different, but about continuing to grow mm -hmm. and continuing to expand myself. Mm -hmm. And so I see that and I try to grow this little seed that maybe is inside of me that's like that. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times some of my decisions also like line with my fear. Hmm. Like if I'm afraid, then I wonder, and I'm, I'm attracted mm -hmm. because I think it's this fear that's gonna make me maybe do something really special. It's this fear that's gonna bring me to a territory I don't know, to a space that I've never experienced of myself and of everything, you know what I mean? And so uh, I tend to like look at it that way. I look for the fear, I look for the growth, I look for, uh, but there's, there's people that talk to me, but in the end, uh, like, like Harrison said, like, like I said, uh, I, I remember this uh, agent I had one time, I was like arguing with her about a part I did. I came back and I was like, I should never have done that. I should never have done this part. And she said, you got on the plane. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> She's like so simple. <laughs> so she said, you got on the plane, not me. And there it is, you know. At least it's been that way for me. That was a long time ago, luckily. <laughs> 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 <So>. <laughs> You mentioned something that I'm very interested in because I think it's true of all these films, that they have an identifiable, invisible moral compass. When you read a script and make a decision about the kind of movie that you're going to make, how important is that, that, they, that these movies have something to say beyond the story they're trying to tell? I think it, 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 it depends. It depends on the, on the film. And, um, you know, some films I think are good that because 
in a way they 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 aren't a judgment on anything. You know, they're just they're just telling a story and putting people through circumstances. And then there are other films I think that have really strong moral arcs, and those are interesting as long as they don't lean too heavily on them. You know, uh, so I mean, I think in, the, in, in with a skilled writer, you're going to have those kind of balances, uh, and they're going to be measured quite well. But um, um, but I don't think it's something that has to be in a script in order for it to be a good film. Mm -hmm. good Sometimes it's nice to make something that's. Well, merely is the wrong word, but entertaining. I mean, we don't, I think, make very many films anymore that are designed to make people happy from the moment they sit down and watch it to the end. We used to do that, mm. but we don't do it nearly so much. And it's quite interesting, I think. Why, why don't we? Um, anybody know? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, we used to make entertainments that were designed to lift your spirits and things. We're very keen mm -hmm. on the moral compass. We're very keen on the moral journey and the arc and, you know, what's the arc of the character and what, are we, what, what journey are we going on with the character? And sometimes, you know, one might be fatigued by that and wish simply to watch something like Singing in the Rain. And we don't do those films very often. I'm just, it's, I'm just mm -hmm. saying. I mean, do you say that nostalgically, that you wish that those films were around? I mean... Yeah, I mean, I do think that it would be good, yes. I okay. think we're very miserableist at the moment. But, in a, I mean, that's not, it's not a bad thing. We've got to explore um, everything. But it's just that that bit of filmmaking is um, oddly underrepresented at the moment. And that's clearly frustrating, or... No, it's not particularly frustrating. It's just here we all are talking about it. Okay, and fair it's enough. one of those things. When you are, I mean, you talked about your first day on set and about how terrifying that is. When you arrive on set or when you're having the, or even the first conversation you're having with a director, what is that you need to hear from him or her that's going to make you know that you're on the same page and that this is going to be a pleasant experience, even if it doesn't turn out to be? What are the kinds of things that you want to hear from a filmmaker as you're considering doing a role that makes you know that this is going to be a worthwhile endeavor? Wow. But they know where to put the camera. Is <laughs> one. But but um, usually there's nothing that they can really say to. Uh, at least for me. I mean, fu and, and funny enough, with with the Coens, as far as they're concerned, they don't they don't give you anything. They don't compliment. You know. And and it was the first time where I really had dealt with that kind of thing where there's no like great babe like <laughs> that was amazing. You know. There's none of that stuff. Like we loved it. It was fantastic because you get so much smoke blown up your butt a lot. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so the fact that they didn't do that at all. That first week, it's terrifying, but then you realize they take away that variable, so you're no longer looking for approval in that way. And, and it's actually a way of seeding power a little mm -hmm. bit, because they're, they're not, you know, they, they just, th their attitude is like, yeah, what else would it be? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. They just come up and go, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Moving on. It's like, great. You know, I don't and, like being complimented while I'm yeah, working. It exactly. makes me feel weird. I much prefer notes like the ones I got from Ang Lee, the sort of... Don't look so old. And, <laughs> you know. That's kind of a hard note now, to address. Yes, he said to Hugh Grant one day, now do one like a very bad actor. And Hugh said, that's the one I just did. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, no, it's better. Or James Ivory, who would you, you, you'd do a scene, a really long, long, complicated scene, and he'd come onto the set, and he'd come towards you, and you'd think, and he'd walk past you and move that <laughs> leg. Yeah. And then he'd come into the thing, and you'd start all over again, and think, OK, no, that's fair enough. I like being left alone, personally. Really? Yeah. You don't want any feedback. How do you know whether or not you're doing a good job? Is it experience? Is it confidence? How do you know if your acting is any good? You keep, on, you keep yeah. asking about good, whether it's good or not. You've got How to be never, there. Okay. You've just got to feel as though you're as there. As you're present. And, and, and that's, that's it. It's, it's, it would be a terrible position to put yourself in to be trying to be somebody else. I mean, I know it is a version of oneself, but it's, it's still a strange trick you're playing on your psyche, isn't it? Sure, yeah. it and it's, it's got its dangers and it's got its joys, but it's a, it's a trick you're playing on your own subconscious. You cannot be standing outside yourself going, how am I doing? Mm -hmm. It would be meaningless. And I bet you great baseball players don't do that either. Mm -hmm. Maybe. They might say, am I uppercutting, am I missing you know, the pitch, right? Yeah, but you know, it's a, it's, those are fine-tuning things. But what are the kinds of things you want to talk to your director about? Do you want to talk about character? Do you want to talk about motivation? Or do you just, not, just want to show up and do the scene? Or well, when is the martini? And, you know, are we anywhere near a bar, if it's me? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to be flippant. But, you know, it's... It, it, 
It was someone else answered that. No, but I think that's exactly right. It's again, you, you can't you can't be so focused on the result of what you're doing. Okay. You know, it 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 has to just be about what's occurring. Um, and not not looking outside because if, as soon as you're doing that you're dead you're you're dead in the water you're self-conscious and you're affected and you know it, it can't be uh, that's their job to look at you know and you trust them to tell you if you're being shit don't yeah. you yeah well I think um, performance is all about relationships and so your relationship with the director changes uh, with who the director is mm -hmm. and obviously I haven't worked with that many film directors yet but. I think you have to be just be listening to what this particular relationship needs and what he needs from you and what you need from him. So I don't think it's useful to have like a, w a rigid way of, of going about working because it will change according to who's directing, who you're working with, and also what your role is. You know, you need different things depending on on your role, and you allow those things to dictate or to suggest to you mm -hmm. how to go about. Um, those relationships. Mm -hmm. Do any of you like to watch your own work? If it's if you stumble upon it late at night on television, if it's on an airplane, even if you're watching video playback on set, how much of your own work are you comfortable watching? Forrest? I think in the early part of my career I, I wasn't comfortable. It was really hard for me to watch my myself. But la later, I don't know if it's from directing or whatever, I've, I've gained a, a little more comfort. Um, and at times it can be helpful to me. You know, uh, like to see something and I say, oh, that's not what I was trying to do. That's not what I was trying to do at all. You know, I, I, I need to, to do this again. You know what I mean? This, or if I try, I can talk to the director and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this and I, I need you to watch me doing that. I go do that and I come back and maybe I might look at it. And then sometimes I just like totally like say, I can't look at it. Mm -hmm. I just got to stay completely in this space. I, you know, whatever happens, happens. It, it's always uh, different, but I'm more comfortable in my my, my uh, after all these years, I guess, <laughs> of uh, of being able to to look at it at least, because before all I saw was bad hmm. when I was young. That's you know. the problem in a way. It's like that you. I don't know about everybody, but it's uh, it's that tendency to be hypercritical to the point that it's just not useful anymore. <laughs> you know that you you can look at something and then just think you could pick it apart, and then especially if you're like looking at playback and you know, I mean, which is. I mean, some people do it. I think in the end, it's kind of crazy because then you're being hypercritical right in the moment, and then you're going to go and try and do it again. I mean, it's you know. So for me, that's just it's kind of impossible. But um, and even later on, if you're watching something, you know, I go into the same loop of just uh, of of just being so critical of it that it's it's not enjoyable. You know what what I mean? the worst is you go and watch a bit of playback and you think, gee, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> I can never do it again, yeah. ever. You know, and that's worse almost. I think I think looking at because you're looking at something from the outside in, and you're actually doing it from the inside out. Mm -hmm. So Very I don't understand how people can do it. I think it would hobble me completely. Harrison, what about you? How do you work? I think that um, I do work from the outside in and from the inside out, mm -hmm. and and I do it. Um, um, without thinking about it, it doesn't doesn't bother me to step out and take a look at it and go look at playback. I sometimes look at at playback for because I want to see the scale of 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 what I'm doing in the in the shot. Mm -hmm. And then well, can sometimes make an adjustment that I think is going to going to force a frame or or create an energy in it that uh that might be useful to the scene, but I I, I like watching uh, stuff when it's in process. I like seeing a, an early cut of a film. I like looking at the playback sometimes. What I can't stand is a finished movie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to watch a finished movie very often. You got to see it once or twice, but uh -huh. uh, but after that, it's there's no more process to it. Hmm. It belongs to somebody else, and while while there's still process, and you have some influence in that process, if you do, it um, you want to you want to uh, um, get the best possible result for mm -hmm. yourself and for everybody else. So I feel comfortable uh, with it up to that point. 
Is that for all of you the most enjoyable part of the job, the process? I mean, I don't know how, how better to describe it in terms of what you enjoy most about your profession. I'll start with you, Lupita. What gives you the most satisfaction and joy? It's, yes, I think it is the process. Um, it's, 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 it's the most enjoyable and the, most, and the scariest thing as well. I mean, from the minute I, I land a role, then it's like terror, because it's like now I have to do it and you have to, and it's that uncomfortable stage where you still don't know what you're doing yet and you're trying to find it. So it's uncomfortable, but then it's also so rewarding because you're the most curious in that, in that, in that stage. And, um, and uh, I I if, you, if you are allowing yourself to dive in, then you disco you're discovering things at every turn. I mean, uh, with 12 Years a Slave being my first film, it was the first time that I was going into a project without a traditional theatrical rehearsal period. And so I had to figure out how to prepare on my own, you know, and uh, imagine my, my scene players. I mean, it was, it was so odd. Um, but um, I, I, and it was an, a daily uh, trial mm -hmm. and I figured stuff out and then it was about getting there and letting go of all that mm -hmm. and just being in the moment with Chiwetel and Michael and Alfre and, and, uh, and Steve and so on. Um, so it's, it's the most exciting, it's the most exciting time that making it and, and discovering new things. Mm -hmm. Would you describe it the same way, Oscar? Definitely, and I don't know if it, this was what it was like for you, but coming from the theater as well, the, the biggest adjustment I had to make at first was the finality of the day, and going home every day and being like, that was it, that was my one shot at getting it, you know, <laughs> hope they got it, because, you know, and then going through the whole thing and being like, nope, nope, didn't do it, oh, that's what it was, that's what it was, and not being able to come back the next day and, and try that new idea, mm -hmm. I think that was a big adjustment to try to make, and so yes, now it's when yeah. you see the full movie and it's like, Oh. <laughs> oh, I could, oh. <laughs> uh, that's why I can't see it, you know, I can see it a couple times, but then it just, be, it's diminishing results afterwards, and I just start tearing it apart. But it, but it is, that, I, think, I think that's exactly. Boris, would you describe it similarly in terms of like what Lupita describes, exactly both the, the exhilaration said. and the terror? Yeah, like the discovery, the, 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 the energy between the people, the, the movement, the feeling, you know what I mean? Uh, that's the exciting part. I mean, at a certain point, it's, it's done. You know, and so the process is when it's alive, mm -hmm. when it becomes in its own sort of organism. It's like it's like it's tangible. You know what I mean? And I, I'm connecting with this person, and we're like trying to figure something out, and we're doing it again and again. Maybe we're not talking about it. We're just jumping, jumping, jumping. You know, and uh, that's a great thing. And to keep learning, mm -hmm. what a great thing to keep like exploring, keep trying to find something new. You know what I mean? Until it's done, as you said, you know, and then it's, it's in the, someone else's hands. Mm. What about, you, what about on, on your side, about what is the greatest pleasure, what is the, the thing that you most enjoy about being an actor? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> Besides panels like this. Obviously, this, <laughs> I know that's this is one. one of the main perks. <laughs> um, I, I, I just love the play. The play, when you know you go, you go onto a set, you go into the, actually this is kind of nice, this magic circle, because say we were acting and not doing this, and you know, we had to do a scene, and we just got something, and we just had to do it, how much fun would we have? Because you know that you're with people who can really do it, so it doesn't matter what you do, they're going to come back at you with something, and then you don't know how you're going to react. I mean, that's so exciting. It's a wonderful way of working, and Lupita, that's, diff that's, that's like what you get in the rehearsal process when you're doing theatre, but you kind of get it in the moment on film because if those cameras catch some, some part of your soul, you yeah. know, they were right, those tribes people, anyway. <laughs> um, but I'm, unlike Harrison, actually, I, well, I, I, having finished that gorgeous bit, I love going to see the film to see what everyone else has done. Oh. The musicians, the Foley artists, the mm. sound balance, the, mm. the way in which it's all been put together by all the other artists who've worked on it because it's such a, it's such a magically, it's such a magical combination of artists and people and the crew, you know, that everyone who then does their bit, that's what I find thrilling. And I sit there in the cinema thinking, what have they all done? I can't wait to see, mm. you know? Mm. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, uh, I think that's right. I think it's about the, uh, the, 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 the most exciting moments are when you're with 
the other actors, I think. And that's the, the bit when you're, when you're seeing somebody else's work and preparation, uh, dedication, craft, just come alive in front of you. And, and you are in the moment of meeting that, of sending back energy, and you're in a dialogue, you're in a, you're in a dance. Um, you know, and so those are great moments when you're, when you're working with actors that you admire and respect, and they're kind of bringing this uh, you know these performances. I mean, when we were doing Twelve Years a Slave, you know that was uh, that was the, that was the sort of delight of it. Mm -hmm. You know, was what what Lupita was bringing and what Michael Fassbender was bringing, what Paul Giamatti was bringing. You know, what what people came to those characters with, and um, and that kind of keeps it alive in the day and keeps it alive in the moment. Uh, so that's really, I think, for me, the most exciting point of it. Mm. Does film acting make you want to do more theater? Does theater act acting make you want to do more film? Because you're describing a process that in theater is recurrent, whereas film it's very fractional, that you're doing that maybe for a minute or maybe 30 seconds and you're resetting. Are they different muscles or is it just the same muscles exercised in a slightly different way? Hmm. It's, a, it's a totally different, it's a totally different thing film acting and theater acting, you know. Um, it actually just speaks yeah. to what you were saying before as, as well, Oscar, that, you know, about the idea of going home at the end of the day. You know, I was just doing a play recently in London, and that's, I mean, that's the gift of it, you know, that you go, you know what, tomorrow, I'm going to do that scene differently. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to make that bit work, I'm going to change that. And mm -hmm. you're also, you know, you've got, you know, doing eight shows a week or whatever, and you've got, uh, and you're thinking about stagecraft, and you're thinking about hitting the back of the auditorium, you're thinking about saving your voice, you're thinking about how am I going to negotiate this week, you know, and, uh, 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 and, um, and sort of deal with the pressures of doing this show, you know. And in a way, you, when you're doing a film, you forget all of that. Mm. You know, you're just in the moment. It is like skin, you know. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's the, um, that's the distinction, but that's also one of the great things about doing theatre, that it just... You, you're working on a totally different muscle. I think. You could be backstage talking about casseroles. You know, I normally put the onions in first, but you should never do that. So hang on a minute, you can go on stage. <laughs> and then you put the garlic in. <laughs> but don't mess up with the paprika. And literally, that's what you do. Is it not so? <laughs> and that's a great way of getting your muscles going, actually, yeah. because if you can do that, you can do anything, really. <laughs> It's true, and also, you know, you, you, you dictate rhythm and pace, and you're your own editor uh, on the stage, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah, exactly. and, and that's, that's why I think a lot of uh, really great uh, stage actors have become great film actors because they have that innate rhythm, and, and I don't have to just make picking up the glass and then drinking it interesting. It's the whole process right. of it, yeah. you know, you have to live through that whole motion. So I think that's something that's... that's um, it's quite different and, and I love about it. But what's also that beautiful thing of going home and getting another chance to do it at night is also its curse as well of theater because that's a long time to do the same thing over and over again and on those nights where it's just, uh, what else can I mine from this thing? That's, that's, that's hard. I don't do theater very, <laughs> I haven't done theater for a long time. But one of the things I love about filmmaking is the urgency of having to get it on the day, within this given period of time, and it and they're, everybody's waiting around for you to get it right, <laughs> and you will, you know, get it as close as you can, and then patience is going gonna, is gonna to wear thin, or you're going to go on to something else, and you'll know that you didn't really get it, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a terrible feeling. So I love the commitment that comes when you're when you're working on film uh, yeah. to to get it today, not walk away till you get it, invest. And, and I also, the other thing I love is the emotional exercise uh, that you have amongst, not just the, the actors that you're working with, but you can, I feel the same way about the crew. I want to make, I want to make that dolly track timing work out. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and all of that stuff is, uh, so you're working with this group of people, um, people in front of the camera, people behind the camera, uh, on this, whatever the nugget of story is that you're working on that day. And there's a, there's a real, uh, I, I, the word is urgency to get it right.
Chuatel, you talked about going back and reading Solomon's book when you were in the process of deciding to make 12 Years a Slave. And everybody here, I mean, even Oscar, to a certain extent, you're playing real, a fictionalized version of a real person. Um, everybody else is playing an, an historical person. As an actor, having the ability to go back and research and read about that character, at what point is that a hindrance? In other words, it's obviously a help in some ways, but at what point does the research become as much of a liability as it is a benefit? Well, it depends on if you're, just how you're using it, really. I mean, if you're using it to tell you absolutely everything about a character and, uh, and using it as a kind of, uh, just a kind of Bible for how you're going to play everything, um, then, and, and a sort of intellectual exercise of, well, he felt this at this point and he felt this at this point, then I think very quickly it's going to become a hindrance. You know, what you're, I think what you're trying to do is actually before you kind of go into the process, I think you're just trying to find a point of connection, mm -hmm. to point of understanding a character. And what is great about having something like an autobiography is that you have this, you have the ability, this is just this incredible gift, you have the ability to start to understand who this person is, and then you take that understanding into the screenplay. Mm -hmm. And then you, your, and your own understanding of what you're, yourself and how you would operate or how you would feel in this in these circumstances and so you try and merge those two things I think but uh, but it was incredibly helpful as you say you know just to have something like that in the beginning is I mean it was amazing for me. Harrison what about Branch Rickey and about about looking at him at obviously a, a real person who has a you know a great life story at what point do you try to embrace some of that and what point do you have to create the character on your own or do they happen at the same time? Um. Well, I, you know, I, 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 I agree with what's just been said because you, you do that research before um, you start working and you do it while you're interpreting the script and when you're asking questions and the process prior to, to actually committing to film. And then you have to, f you have to, you have to be the one uh, to be Branch Rickey. You have all that tucked in somewhere, and it's and it's helped you to understand it up to that point. But then, you uh, you're wearing the clothes. It's your eyes. Uh, it's your voice. It's your heart. Your emotions. Emma, what about Mrs. Travers? Um, well, she really terrified me because I had no idea, absolutely no idea how to play her because she was so peculiar. Um, but I, I, I absolutely, everything you've all said is so right. There was lots of material. There was books and documentaries and, and there was her voice on mm -hmm. tape and I was of it. She was ghastly. And um, so it was like, you know, you pack your suitcases and you put that in and you put everything in and then you kind of basically you walk up to the top of the building and then you have to leave it all behind and jump off the building and you have to hope that when you jump off you get that lovely feeling do you know that feeling where you go oh I've just felt the wind I've just felt the wind and I can yeah. I can surf now I can, I, don't, I can leave all that stuff I've because if you're carrying it you, you it's over right it's over you've got to be there and it's a fascinating thing is sometimes you can get terrified by, by there being too much material about a person. I mean, it wasn't so bad for me because nobody knew anything about her, but imagine what it must have been like for Tom Hanks playing Walt Disney. You know, ghastly, really. Um, difficult to let go of all that information, but you have to, otherwise you can't be them. Solomon's book obviously talks a little bit about Patsy, but there's not a lot of information in, in his book, but there's the beginning of, of a character so you have a beginning and where do you go from there? Yeah, I mean, it was, those were treasures. Everything that Solomon Northup said about Patsy was, there were just nuggets of juiciness, you know, and that really helped set me in the right direction. But for me, whenever I'm working on any role, I'm looking to investigate something about humanity that may not necessarily appear in the script. It's something that interests me mm -hmm. um, because I recognize that 
in, in, especially in this situation, I'm not a historian. I'm, my job was not to represent slavery at large or, or, or the plight of women. It was very specific to represent this woman and what she meant to me. Like, you know, how did, I, how did she speak to me? Um, so that's what I, 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 I use as my barometer of, of working. What do I want to investigate with this role about humanity? What do I want to have enlightened? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I go about it in that way. Oscar, you had a little bit more freedom because your character is fictional, but obviously there's a lot of reference that you can look at in mm -hmm. terms of what the Coen brothers were drawing on and what the music of the era was. How did that work for you? It was all great. I mean, it just, it just you know, um, creates a corral to play in, basically. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, all that was, was food, but you can't be beholden to any of it either. I think that's exactly right. Or like you said, with the suitcases, or it's almost like a, the, you get all the ingredients in the kitchen, and then you pick up the kitchen and shake it and see if something edible <laughs> comes out. You know? mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, uh, all that stuff was just helpful to get the... the um, yeah, to, to, to understand, but I like to, I like to pick from, even if you're playing someone that, um, you know, existed, I, I try to get very random inspirations, you know, even with like King John, for instance, you know, I did go and read a lot about King John and visited his tomb, but then I thought, it'd be cool to play him as Robert Plant, too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you, you know, you try to mess it all up in your head so it's not, a, it's not an academic exercise. Yeah, it's not a documentary, it's really right. yeah. a documentary. Yeah. What about you, Forrest, with Cecil? Um, you know, it's always different because sometimes I've I played a few real-life characters. Like with Bird, I, it was more the music and a few images, you know. And with the, I think with Idi Amin, it was, it had more historical reference and language. I think with Cecil, it's different because he's not a real character. I mean, the character's name is Eugene Allen, and he had a particular life. And Cecil is, is a, you know, is a butler that's representing mini butlers, you know what I mean? Uh, but I think it was, I think, I think for me it's, it's extremely helpful because I have something to hold on to. Because when I first start the part, I'm a little nervous and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm looking for something to grab. And maybe I'll grab it inside of the, the profession, maybe I'll grab it into something else. In this case, maybe I listen to this, his voice, you know? But then I realized this character that, that Lee Daniels wrote is actually, is actually from another place. So then I'm like learn the accent here and I try to marry this voice and all of a sudden something starts to happen where it starts to become its own thing and I look at the history around it and it gives me ideas and I start to think okay what would I feel right now I remember when I was when I was doing bird I'll be like why would he play this right now because this note must mean this feeling and this note must mean that feeling you know what I mean that's what's going on in his life so I was using like his life like with Eugene Allen as like reference points to like figure out to give me more more scope to my own imagination you know what I mean? And then, and, then I, and then I would try to live in that. You know what I mean? And, and at a certain point, uh, like, like I said, I, I guess I, I try to surrender. I get all this like, human information and I start pushing that myself. And at a certain point, I just like say, okay, I'm gonna walk out, I'm gonna fall off the cliff, I'm gonna dive, I'm gonna know that, the, that the, there's no ground, but my wings are gonna carry me as you try to talk about. I, at a certain point, you know what I mean? I just surrender. Mm. When I surrender, I'm imagining and believing my, in myself that it really is another thing and it, it exists in another plane, even though, like you say, it's you, but I kind of like, I kind of try to, I think at some points I, I may be psychotic, but sometimes I, I start to believe that, that I'm something else, you know what I mean, that, uh, that uh, it's not me. Maybe I transmute and like the molecules shift and my skin starts to change and I don't know, you know, you know? but I know that in the end I'm going to go back home see my kids and stuff like that and you know so I, I anyway it's like, like this accumulated information that then I just kind of fall off the cliff as she said and then hope that the universe is gonna grant me a little air under my wings you know like as, as, as you said so we're beautifully. Just, we're just living proof that everyone is everone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Aren't we? <laughs> yeah, that's the molecule I'm trying to find. That's right? it, yeah. It exists in me, I just gotta look for it and find it and surrender yeah, enough to that's get it. there. Yeah. Didn't let it grow, right? Yeah. You know, like, kind of thing. That said, and I suspect if you, if like, 
the right pair of shoes isn't really going to save you from finding a, a character. But if you get on set, if you're uh, in Louisiana, if you're on set, you have the right costumes, the right props. How much does that help you in terms of having those physical tools around you, the costume, the sense of place? And I know, uh, Chuitel, the first day you were filming 12 Years a Slave, it was 108 degrees. The physical manifestations of the part, even if you've kind of cerebrally understood the character you're playing, how much do they help to get you to the next point? Yeah, that was, it was, um, um, it was sort of diving in, in a way, just into the deep end. You know, you just, uh, it's exactly what people are talking about, the, the Forrest is saying about surrendering and just this idea that um, you can have all that preparation, you can have everything, but if you're out there and it's 108 degrees, you're, you're battling something else. You know, you're deep down the rabbit hole at that point and you're going to have to, you, and you are understanding this character then in a completely different way, you know, which is one of the great advantages of shooting you know, very close to where the, where the, the events happened, you know, because then you, you sort of, you, you suddenly understand the book totally differently. You understand Solomon's life totally differently. You're like, oh, it was 108 degrees when he was doing this. You know, it's sort of like, I see now, this is, it sort of changes everything. It changes that whole, that cotton plantation is, you know, it's, it's just completely transformed in your mind and you understand in a different way what everybody's going through. But I, you know, if, uh, talking about wardrobe and, you know, that's, to me, that's one of the most important days that you can have as an actor is when you first go in. You know, we had Paddy Norris, who was just amazing on this, on this, uh, on this film, and, uh, and you, you go in on that day and you start to put on things, you know, and uh, you're standing in front of the mirror and you're putting on this and, you, uh, and you're trying to formulate, you know, I mean, the scrutiny with which, you know, I don't know about everybody else, but the scrutiny with which you stare at yourself in those moments <laughs> to try and see if the guy's coming out at you, you know. Um, and, uh, and then you try something else and maybe there's the shoe and then you do the thing and, and then maybe it's just a pulling of a shirt or something and you see something, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, okay, there's something in here that's like, okay, let's try this, but the, we'll put a blue one on or whatever. And, um, and something is there and that's the sort of, you're just, you're always in the hunt for this, those little, 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 just little details that, like, that, that's like Hansel and Gretel can just lead you towards the guy. And those are the pieces that when they start to come in that can make all the difference, I think. Emma, do you have the same fondness for wardrobe and the fittings? Do they have that same kind of ability to transform you? I mean, sometimes, you know, take silly, Sybil Trelawney, I mean, David Cameron could have played her. It's just glasses and a wig. But for me, with this one, it was, um, you had 108 degrees. I had a perm. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not a perm, Frances Mathias, who designed the hair, so it's just not a perm. It's a kind of kink. You're going to look like Annette Benning, and it's don't panic, it's not a perm. So I thought, wow, oh, Annette always looks marvellous, I love that kink in her hair. Um, she's a marvellous actress, perhaps I'll, it'll help. Um, anyway, we went in, and of course it was a perm, uh, and it was frightful. I looked like a sheep, as you can see, and um, that helped enormously, but I couldn't get away from it. I had to live with it for months on end. It was hell. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very, very useful because a person with curly hair, it's a, just a different thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Harrison, what about you and wardrobe? You have that, you have story, is that the same kind of connection sometimes to a character? Uh, yeah, no, it's a huge, uh, um, it's a huge descriptor of character. Um, and it's, it's more fun when you're playing a character part mm -hmm. rather than a leading man, which there are a bunch of people around saying, well, this looks better on you. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they just want to make you look really good, which is, I have a whole s closet full of those suits. <laughs> <laughs> but what was really fun wha uh, in playing Branch Rickey was, uh, you know, or finding the right fat suit, finding what happened, uh, you know, to what the clothes were like uh, around a fat suit, and how that how you felt in that assumed weight and mass. Mm. I I love wardrobe. Mm. Really, it's a great thing. 
Great Lupita, process. you didn't have much to wear in your in your film, but it it felt like I mean it's so much authentic period costume in Twelve Years a Slave. I mean, did that help you discover the character? Most definitely. And one of the things that I do when I'm preparing for a role is I make my own rehearsal outfit. <laughs> so I had something mm -hmm. um, definitely not of that time, but I had something that I'd w wear to rehearsals with Chiotel and Michael and and stuff just because wearing jeans just didn't mm. feel right you know mm -hmm. and and trying to find patsy and and then yes i remember patty saying to me on the day the first day i tried on the clothes that this my, some of my clothes actually belong to um slave women mm. so i was actually wearing like <laughs> their clothes and that was Oh, it, it was, I, I felt really spooked out when she said that. And then I thought, what a gift, mm. you know, because it just, it just added another level of reverence, you know, stepping into those clothes and really just stepping into that experience. And um, yeah, it was ever so helpful. And she was so specific that Patsy's clothes were always a little bit nicer than everybody else's because she was right. the mistress to the master. And, and um, you know, and that and that brought about a lot of interesting conversations with like the background actors and stuff. Um, but yeah, it definitely made a huge difference. And also, I remember uh, in preparing for the role, I hadn't really spent time visualizing the background performance. Mm -hmm. And I remember the very first day I walked on st on set in costume and saw them, and I was like. My goodness, these people look straight out of another age. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, oh God, I look exactly the same, you know? And um, yeah, it was just very um, transportive that mm -hmm. being in those clothes, in that environment, in that heat, all of it, mm -hmm. all of it helps to take you to a time you never knew. What about you, Oscar? I mean, you're obviously in a very specific period, a very specific place, New York, 1960s. Mm -hmm. Does all that help you a little bit to get back and in, to get into that character or to yeah, take it yeah. to the next Music level? Music and all that. Um, shoes are super important to me, especially his shoes. They were the saddest little shoes, just like a piece of leather wrapped right. around his foot with some <laughs> rubber glued to the bottom. So I got Not those. Good in the snow, I think. Yeah, so I got those for a, a month before. Luckily, Mary's office said yeah, we found them, and, and so I would just walk around in those all the time, and that that. That really influenced a lot. Hair-wise, it was a big thing too because we were trying to figure out what he would look like, and that's one of the first times you really have to interface with a director in a, in a very particular way, uh. and you really start to get in sync. And so I had this idea because I have quite curly hair. I have the perm, huh. yeah, naturally. And so I, uh, I was like, but you know, you know, I saw some pictures of Dave Van Ronk, and I was like, he had this like long hair that would go down. I was like, how about I get it straightened? And Joel. Cohen was skeptical. <laughs> and he's like, "All right, okay. Well, why don't you go over and we'll come by and we'll we'll, we'll take a look." So I show up and he they get it all straightened, and he looks at it and he goes, "What what do you think?" And I go, "I don't know. I think I kind of I kind of like it. It kind of works." And he goes, "Okay, good. Because I f hate it. <laughs> Me, I just I I f hate it." Um, I'm like, "Okay, yeah. So maybe we'll go back to the curly <laughs> one, I guess." And I don't really feel that strongly about it. Uh, <laughs> And you know, and it's such a it's such a character thing. I think he was he was quite right. But uh, but yeah, so you start to get on the same page right away. I think. What about you, Forrest? The same as what everyone's saying. You know, like the first time you look at yourself and that the weight of the clothes, the the feeling of it. You know, mm -hmm. trying to makes you have to think about the character because you're you're becoming very specific about what he should be wearing, how he should be dressed. You know, and uh, and I think it's it's a good glimpse. So yeah. if the director is maybe right in that circumstance, but not right in other circumstances, I mean, I, I, think, I think to the Spike Jones line in Being John Malkovich, where he told John Malkovich when he had an objection about a line of dialogue, John Malkovich wouldn't say that. And John Malkovich said, well, I would have said that, actually. If a director is actually <laughs> maybe, not let's say mistaken, or has a different interpretation about a scene, line of dialogue, staging, how do you have a conversation with him or her about what you think that scene should be and how the dialogue should be played? When you feel strongly about the way you want to go and the director has a different idea, what does that sound like? And what does it look like? I know it varies from film to film and director to director. <laughs> Harrison's laughing. I think you, do you have a couple of circumstances? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I, have no I have no specific circumstance. I think the best thing is, is to, is 
try not to have that happen on the day. If you have a concern about a line of dialogue or some script or an issue with uh, a story point, I, I like to address it um, every day till it gets <laughs> resolved, but not on the actual day that it's, that it's coming up. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think those, those kinds of discussions with a director are very important. And, it, and they go according to who the director is. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it can be, a, can be a hard slog or it can be easy. With the first day of Sense of Sensibility, Ang Lee, it was the first time he'd worked in English, in England. And we did a scene, me and Hugh, finished it and then said, can we do it, can we do it again? And can we stand over there? I mean, you know, we're just as act as normal thing. You just go, well, can we just... And Ang, who's one of the most wonderful people on the face of the planet, said, yes, and we did it. And the whole, everything went all very quiet and it was very strange. And then everyone clearly was up all night because yeah. no one had ever, ever done that to him before. Because in Taiwan, right. the director is emperor. You never question. You would, an actor suggesting something that you would move somewhere differently is absolutely out of the question. It was the first time it had happened to him. So that was, a ve that was a very interesting moment because I was up at three o'clock in the morning writing a long apology. So I'm so sorry, <laughs> Ang, I've, it was, it was, it's a cultural thing, you know, we're <laughs> used to that. But, so that was kind of interesting. I've met that, that just came to mind when you were talking about that. Outside of your hair, if Joel and Ethan were wrong about something, would you? Would often, you I know, but could you have a, how, would you, how do you approach that when they are, you know, writers, directors, they're clearly incredibly talented filmmakers who have a point of view. What does that conversation sound and look like? With them, I, it would just probably be, a, I would trick them into thinking I was doing the thing they wanted me to do, but still do the thing I wanted. <laughs> um, no, uh, no, you know, I think what was great about with the, the, the two of them and the three of us was that it was always, and even between the two of them, whoever felt the strongest about something. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't always the case, you know? So sometimes if I had an idea that I felt pretty strong about, but someone like Joel or Ethan had felt much stronger that it's not the right way to go, then you just check myself and I think, all right, well, how important is this? And, and clearly he has a, a very strong argument the other way. It's, but it's a conversation at least, you know? And, and mm -hmm. I think that's, even between the two of them, you know, uh, whenever it was whoever felt the most passionate about going one way or the other. Okay. And then seeding that would, would be pretty easy in those circumstances. And Forrest? It depends, you know. Um, it, you, you tr you're working with somebody mutually and you're trying to do something together and maybe in that case you have to, maybe you'll, you'll try it a different way, you know, but you'll want to do it a particular way. Sometimes if something is just, feels just absolutely false, um, maybe not. You know, it, it really, it really depends. I mean, I try to like live in the truth, you know, and um, but most of the time, I'm we're always working as a team. You figure, like you say, like I'm starting in rehearsals or official rehearsals or even before, like just because it's not official rehearsals doesn't mean I'm not rehearsing. So I may have like chosen all my clothes. I may, be, I may be walking around for a week or so in this, in the shoes and the jacket and the stuff. And so the director has been talking to me too, you know. Maybe he saw me. You know, I come in and I say, you see, what I'm th you see what I'm thinking, you know? And so hopefully we get to a place where we know we're working, we're working for the same goal. You know what I mean? Uh, and most of the time for me, it's always, it's that way. But every once in a while, you come to a space where it's like, maybe this is just for a spectacle. Has nothing, maybe you want me to rend my clothes or something. And I'm just like, why? You know, <laughs> so, but I mean, but mostly, all, I'd say almost all the time, I'm, I'm in a, in a joint venture, mm -hmm. with the filmmaker. You know what I mean? And sometimes the filmmaker is open with the DP, you know, trying to say, you know, I know you want to do that, but when you do that, we really can't see it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, but he would really be down here. <laughs> 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 no, no, but I'm just saying, it depends, you know. Uh, uh, most of the time it's worked out really well for me. I, I, mean. I had one of those things where the director was like, it's just, he blamed the technology. It's like, we just can't capture it. We just don't have the technology to capture 
all that you're doing. <laughs> so we just, I'm sorry, it's us. It's not you. We just don't really have. Come back in 100 years and have the technology. Uh, I want to end with this question. Not, not that experience necessarily brings wisdom, but as somebody with experience, looking at Lupita, who is a young actor, what would be the advice that you wish at your age somebody had told you about what laid ahead that you would share with younger actors that would have benefited you or just as good advice in general? Oh God. Um, well, if you can't fail, you can't do anything. That's it really, I mean, but you know that anyway. You're brave already, so it doesn't matter. I just, oh God, I don't know. I mean, I know, I, 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 I may be ancient, but I don't think I'm particularly wise but I have got a bit braver as I've got we, you were saying for us you know if I get something wrong I don't mind much anymore because I think well I might do it again and I might get it right and if I don't get it right it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. um, but the, I think that you can't have that until you're old do you know what I mean so I'll have to think about it I it experienced not old no no that's fine <laughs> I, I don't mind being old at all it's perfectly all right and I think we're ridiculous about it I'm ridiculous about all this Denial. What, what's wrong with it? I'm it's, uh, very happy to be still alive, quite frankly. <laughs> um, when the opposite, the opposite could so easily be true. You go, Jimmy, because I can't. I can't think. Uh, advice. Uh, advice. You're still very uh, young too. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us. We don't want to give any advice at all. <laughs> Harrison's experience. Come on, Harrison. No, I'm old. Okay, you're old. I'm old. What would be the advice you would give to your younger self if you could? Um, uh, well, as, as for myself, it, it, I, I, I probably the advice I, would, I gave myself w would not be suitable, suitable for anybody, anybody <laughs> else. <laughs> but I think the one th the th that a, a, for a younger actor, there is there the. The, necess the necessity to be truthful to yourself is really important. But, but basically, you have to, that's very important, but you also have to learn how to be useful. And probably the, more, the most important thing is to learn to be useful to a variety of different people under a variety of different circumstances. And that means working. I, the one thing they never teach you in acting schools is um, uh, how to work with people, how to deal with a director and a cinematographer, and, and, and I suppose they can't, and probably they shouldn't. But that's what you have to figure out how to do, how to negotiate the space, how to be useful, and at the same time, uh, trick them into thinking you're doing what they <laughs> what they wanted you to do, and all of the rest of of the acquired wisdom that I've heard today. Uh, but finally, and then on top of that uh, comes what Emma uh, so um, easily said: it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I don't know quite how to explain that, but, but it does set you free. It's like the old joke about Hollywood, the key to success is sincerity, and if you can fake that, you've got it made. Uh, I want to thank you all for showing up. This has been a, a fascinating conversation. I'm sorry we have to wrap it up, but congratulations to your great performances, and thank you so much for giving your time to us and talking about acting. It was my pleasure. <laughs>